this will be our last video before Wednesday. And Wednesday, what we're going to do is focus on this little section. Just because then we can talk about the change in direction of the magnetic field and therefore the induced current in the coil, which has to do with the coils, the way they're wound, and therefore the direction of the magnetic field. It's just something that's going to be easier discussed when you all can ask me questions than me doing a video of it and you yelling at the screen, quite honestly. So we'll do that Wednesday. And what I do want to do is kind of focus on this thing that we actually use and then talk about how um, we look at these in circuits. Now, there is one little piece that you're going to notice here. Alternating current. Yeah, don't have time. But what you get out of your wall isn't DC, it's alternating current. What um, inductors are really good for is for controlling changes in the alternating current. So remember, an inductor opposes change in a magnetic field. If I have a changing, um, I'm sorry, if I have a changing current and current comes with its own magnetic field, then that means the current also has a changing magnetic field with the changing quantity of the current. Mm. And the inductor wants to oppose that change. Don't freak out about that. We're just gonna talk about DC for now with our inductor so you can kind of get a good flavor for how they work. But you'll notice that I have in, in defined inductance in terms of N which is the number of coils times the change in flux over the current. So the flux is, remember, the amount of magnetic field going through my surface. So the reason for more and more coils, think of it as I have one surface plus another surface plus another surface, and I can keep adding those surfaces on. So I can increase my inductance by increasing the amount of coils that I have. And again, we're gonna come back to the energy stored in that and how to figure out what direction it is. We'll do that on Wednesday. But right now, all I want you to think about is then I can change my inductance by having more and more surface area or more and more coils. This is the part I wanted to get to today because this really is just an add-on and that's gonna make this relatively short the fun thing about inductors is because they resist change. If you remember in our capacitors, for a capacitor, we defined tau as equaling the resistance in the circuit times the capacitance in the circuit. For our inductors, instead of inductance times capacitance, it's this L over R because our inductor is resisting change. So the, that's the only thing that's flipping in, as far as how we can view um, the amount of time that it takes to charge or discharge a capacitor. And the way I like to describe it is like you have this really rusty um, water wheel and I start letting some water hit it and it might budge a teeny, teeny, tiny amount but it's gonna resist the flow of the water hitting it until I finally get it going and it can hit this steady state. Then I'm not gonna have a change. I'm gonna hit this plateau, and here is the plateau. Once I get there, so long as the current stays constant, it just kinda of keeps on flowing like the inductor doesn't exist. So it's this flip side from our capacitor. So remember, with the capacitor, it initially looks like an open wire. So I can get like maximum current through the capacitor as soon as I open it when it's fully discharged. Let me rephrase that. That sounded very confusing in my head. If it is fully discharged, so there's no charge on it, when I flip the switch, I get the most amount of current because it's, the current doesn't see any resistance there initially. And then that resistance starts to build up and build up and build up as the, the plates get charged. With my inductors, it's the opposite way. So I've got to make that little wheel start spinning. So I'm gonna slowly chip away at the resistance seen in the wheel. But once it hits its inductance, so once I've induced a steady state magnetic field, now that thing looks like there's nothing there. 
And what's fun is we're going to talk about where the energy is stored from one to the other. So the capacitor, we talked about it in terms of the capacitance and the, and the voltage. And now we can talk about inductors. So this literally is the last little piece that we're going to add into is just looking at charging or discharging. So current through, let's think about this. I said it is resisting the total amount that I can get in there. So e to the negative t over tau, it becomes 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So initially, whew, yep, don't want to let any through. And that means when it's discharging, I'm going to have the opposite happening, which is fun. So what you will do, unlike the last exam where I accidentally gave you the answer, is uh, we're actually going to solve for how much time does it take to hit a steady state current, which will be fun. And that is essentially going to be like tau is at infinity, but as you can see from the graph, we don't actually have to get into infinity to essentially make that exp exponential look like zero to the circuit. The thing that I was hoping to get everybody to do until I rushed through to fix my boo-boo um, was to actually solve for this. So let's just kind of say that I want to know um, when am I going to get I equals, there we go, I equals like, I don't know, 50% I not. So <clears throat> when do I get, oops, 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 oops. No, that's not what that would mean. Oh, gosh. Oh, goodness. Let's rewrite this correctly. Don't, why don't we? So if I divide I by I naught and I want to know when I have 50% of I naught, so this is going to equal 0.5. That's where I was going wrong. Let's see, then I get equals like 1 minus e to the negative t over tau. And then this is just moving my 0.5 minus my one, e oh hello, that was interesting. Come back, it's not going to. Alrighty, I have no idea what drugs my computer just did. Let's get us to that page again, shall we? Oh, it totally erased it, fine. All right, so we have 0.5, Minus 1 equals e to the negative t over tau. So this part of the equation stays the same. It's just how we calculate tau that's different. And the, the one thing I want to emphasize here is then how do we solve for our time? Is I know that there were some panicked faces, so I just want to take a second and, and talk about that. To undo an exponent, so if I have an e to the, the way I undo that is take the natural log of both sides. So I take ln of negative 0.5 times ln of e to the negative t over tau. It's kind of like taking the arc sign of something to figure out what the angle is. ln does the same thing. So this piece there goes away and I end up with ln of negative 0.5 equals negative t over tau. Generally, we know this, or we know this. So if I gave you the amount of time and wanted to know if you knew what the resistors were, oh, that would be fun. So if you knew what our equivalent resistance was in the circuit, then you could have like minus T over, let's see, tau is L over R. So I'd end up with negative T R over L on the one side equals ln of negative 0.5, negative. So I could use that and give you any of the pieces, either time, resistance, or inductance, and ask you for another one. That was the initial goal for the last exam, so I would pretty much be prepared for being able to do this on this one. I'm not gonna accidentally give you the answer this time. So in that way, we can do that. The only other thing I want to emphasize to you is some of these symbols that you're going to see. This is induced EMF, or 
if you can use it as the voltage for your source but you're gonna see these these squiggly E's that I can't do that's why I never use them you don't want me to um, that is just saying voltage it's another fancy way of saying voltage so just like our resistors let's see so we know for these V equals I R well we have a definition for oh we don't I didn't give that to you that would be helpful our induced EMF in a coil being related to the number of coils, the change in our flux over the amount of time that takes. And here you go. This is what I was going to start doing on the other page. This is just to kind of bring you back to how we defined that potential for both our capacitors and for our resistors, the amount of voltage lost. So there you have it. All I want you to do until Wednesday with this piece is come back here and just kind of picture for yourself what's going to happen as current changes with time. Can I predict um, how much current is going to flow or how long it's going to take me to get to a maximum amount of current where we don't even see the inductor anymore? Um, the biggest change, yeah, uh, so Think about it in terms of percentages. So if I asked you when I'm going to hit like a quarter of the max current, current, how would you get there? And then remind yourself of finding equivalent resistance within a circuit because that same application applies to our inductors. So if you can do that, you are going to be on the path to being able to solve this little fella, which is what we will do on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we'll hit this one. And I'm going to start off by talking about the direction of the induced current and the coils and how we deal with, is the coil going this way or is the coil going this way? So therefore, how do I know what direction my current is going to go for the change in my magnetic field? And my hint to you is referred back to the last video where we talked about increasing or decreasing and what direction the current's going to go to handle that change. And with that, that's it. It's the last video you have to watch. Uh, we will see you in lecture on Wednesday.